All right, thanks everybody. Thanks, Michael. Uh, I'm Josh Rosen, a Spark committer at Databricks. Uh, today I'm gonna be talking about Project Tungsten, a uh, effort to improve the CPU and memory efficiency of Spark applications. Uh, before I do though, just in case uh, anyone is unfamiliar by this point, uh, let me tell you a little bit about Databricks. Uh, Databricks is a company that was founded by uh, the creators of Spark and remains its largest contributor today. Uh, we offer a hosted cloud service for running Spark on EC2 with interactive notebooks, plot visualizations, cluster management, and scheduled jobs. So the goals of Project Tungsten, it's all about memory and CPU, improving the efficiency of Spark applications, and pushing the limits of the underlying hardware. Over the course of this talk, I wanna start by providing a little bit of motivation for why we're focusing on CPU and memory optimizations as opposed to network and disk. Once we've identified why CPU is sometimes the bottleneck for Spark workloads, we're gonna take a look at the building blocks of how Tungsten addresses these uh, bottlenecks. Um, we'll take a look at two case studies, uh, how Tungsten optimize aggregate and group by queries in Spark SQL, and how we do optimized record sorting. I'll present some initial performance results uh, to show how Project Tungsten can speed up real customer workloads, and then at the end, I'll provide a little bit of a roadmap showing which pieces of Tungsten are available today in Spark 1.4, how you can use them, and what we have planned for the next few releases. So, many big data workloads are now compute bound, uh, which sort of runs contrary to the traditional wisdom that network and disk IO are, are significant bottlenecks. There's a paper here from NSDI called Making Sense of Performance and Data Analytics uh, Frameworks. For those of you who went to Kay's talk yesterday, this is a, a paper form of that talk. And I'll summarize the key findings here. They analyzed a bunch of uh, trace workloads of Spark jobs and found that if you look at how much gain you can get by doing only like network or disk optimizations, the sort of median reduction in job completion times was quite modest. You know, about 2% if you do network optimizations, at most 19% for disk. And in analyzing Databricks customer workloads for a lot of analytic stuff, we've observed sort of similar patterns. So why is it the case that CPU is the new bottleneck in many of these workloads? A major driver of this is changes in hardware trends. Uh, hardware has improved significantly. Uh, in data centers, you're seeing solid state disks being widely deployed. You're seeing 10 gigabit ethernet. And this hardware offers much more aggregate bandwidth and eliminates a lot of bottlenecks. Frameworks themselves have become better too. Uh, Spark has been significantly optimized uh, for its I.O. layers over the past several releases. In many cases, we either perform less I.O. now, or when we do have to do it, we do it more efficiently. Uh, in Spark SQL, we do aggressive partition pruning to avoid scanning data that we don't need to access to run your query. Um, in addition, in Spark 1.2 and later releases, we have a new network layer and a new sort-based shuffle layer that are both much more efficient. Data formats have also improved. We're seeing a lot more jobs nowadays use uh, compressed data formats like Parquet instead of formats like text input. And an advantage of these formats is that the data is stored much more densely, uh, which gives you nice I.O. benefits. But it comes at the cost of having to do additional work on the CPU. You now have to either reconstruct records or deserialize them, and this is sort of an inherently CPU-bound task. Finally, you know, you know, sort of building on that point, a lot of data workloads spend significant amounts of time either serializing records to and from like a wire format and the format that they use for their internal representation and in doing hashing records for sorting and comparison and partitioning. And these are sort of inherently CPU bound tasks. So Project Tungsten addresses these bottlenecks with a combination of three different techniques. The sort of main foundation of Tungsten is manual memory management and binary processing. And what I mean by this is that instead of representing objects uh, using the Java object model, we leverage our knowledge of data schema to actually directly lay out objects in memory ourselves, much in the way that someone programming in C would. Um, and this has benefits both in uh, fitting more data into memory and avoiding some of the garbage collection overheads of the JVM. And I'll go into this point in a little bit. Once you have this building block in place for being able to lay out your data manually, you can begin to consider cache-aware uh, optimizations. On a lot of modern processors, when your data fits in memory, uh, the memory access patterns still matter significantly. Um, the difference between doing random memory accesses and a sequential scan can be quite significant. So when you control your data layout, you can actually make it in a way that's friendly for CPU cache efficiency. Finally, code generation. Uh, in various parts of Spark, we can actually generate bytecode on the fly uh, to evaluate parts of your query. And this can actually give large efficiency 
benefits. And I think the sort of unifying theme that sort of runs through all of these optimizations is that generality has a cost. In cases where you have application semantics, and you either know how you're going to process your data, or the data layout, or both, you can implement sort of special purpose optimizations that give you big wins compared to a more general system. So let's kind of walk through each of these optimizations in turn uh, to sort of understand examples of how tungsten works. Uh, so here's an example of a Java object, a Java string, A, B, C, D. And we're going to look at the overhead of Java objects for this data. Now, and sort of a native encoding of this might only require four bytes. Uh, I can encode it in UTF-8. I have four ASCII characters. They take one byte each. Let's take a look at how much space the same string takes in Java. 48 bytes, which is kind of crazy. And the way that this sort of breaks down is that we have a Java object header tracking metadata about that object. We have space for the hash code. And we have an array of characters for representing each uh, character of the string. Those characters are two bytes each. And the uh, character array itself also has a hash code and also has a header and all of these overheads. So this is an enormous overhead here. Also, garbage collection. So Java garbage collection uh, has certain properties uh, that big data uh, workloads hit and sort of result in undesirable access patterns for GC. So Java garbage collection, at a very high level, works generationally. It has this heuristic that objects that are shorter lived are sort of better candidates for early garbage collection compared to objects that have stayed around for a long time. And also, the cost of performing garbage collection is sort of proportional to the number of distinct objects in your heap. So imagine that you have a big data workload which caches a lot of Java objects in a memory. Not only are you paying uh, large garbage collection overheads, because now it has to contend with, say, tens, hundreds of millions of objects, if those objects stick around for a long time, garbage collecting them suddenly becomes a very expensive process. There are options to deal with this. You can do garbage collection tuning and other techniques. Uh, but it's a very complicated sort of uh, black art, and ideally, big data should be easy, and you shouldn't have to do this. So how can we do better? How can we actually build a manual data layout and sort of eliminate some of these overheads? Inside of the JVM, there's a sort of neat API called sun.misc.unsafe. And the name unsafe comes from the fact that it's sort of an escape hatch on the me uh, memory safety that Java gives us. And using this, we can actually sort of read and write raw regions of memory with no safety checks, and we can actually build uh, complicated in-memory data structures. So um, I'm going to show first uh, how we can actually build flat data structures, like laying out a record. On top of that, we're going to look at how you can build data structures with pointers um, embedded in them, like hash maps. And based on that, we're going to get to very complex examples, hash maps or aggregation, buffers for sorting and things. and uh, so this section is going to get a little bit technical, so just follow along as uh, far as you get, and we'll loop back to some sort of high-level stuff very soon. So let's take, for example, I want to represent a row, like from Spark SQL or data frames, and I want to um, represent it in a compact format. If I store a row as Java objects, uh, it has significant overheads. Here I have a row uh, with three columns, an integer column and two strings, and I have one, two, three data bricks. And if I look at representing this sort of naively as a Java object, I have at least five objects of overhead, you know, boxed objects for each of the primitives. I have a wrapper class for my row. I have arrays for holding my data. This is a very high overhead. Also, let's say I want to do sorting or comparison of these rows. To actually compute the hash code of an object like this is going to be fairly complicated because I have to hash a bunch of different elements. It's an expensive process. So in Project Tungsten, uh, we have custom layouts for rows and stuff that eliminate a lot of these overheads. And I'll walk through one of our formats that we call unsafe row. So here's the basic format. Our rows um, have three different regions. They have a null tracking bit field, a region of some fixed length values, and some variable length values. Every column appears once in the fixed length value section. So integers, doubles, floats, primitive types, they all stay here, and we use eight bytes for every field. If I have a variable length value like a string, what we do is we actually store a relative offset in the fixed length section that points to a uh, data in the variable length section, and we have some length tracking information there. The rows are al always eight byte word aligned, uh, which, as we'll see later, lets us do some sort of interesting compression techniques for addresses. There's also sort of one nice property of this layout. If we want to compare two rows for equality, um, we have this interesting property 
where equal rows have bitwise identical representations. So I can compare rows for equality or I can hash them just by taking a look at the raw bytes without having to do any sort of type specific interpretation. And this can make uh, things very efficient. So here's that same tuple that I had on the screen before, but in the unsafe ro row format. I have my null tracking bitmap, uh, which here is empty because all the fields are present. I have my small values, like one, two, three, inlined, and then I have relative offsets to the variable length data for the two other string fields. So now that we've actually seen how do you build sort of flat data structures in memory, right, reading and writing to raw regions of memory, how do you build up to, say, a data structure like a hash map, where you have to store sort of internal pointers? So to provide a little bit of background on this, we have to understand a little bit about how the Java unsafe APIs encode memory addresses. So in unsafe, there's sort of two ways to get a chunk of memory that you can address and do what you want with. The first way is to take a Java object and uh, treat its internal bytes as memory that you can read and write. And the way that this works is you have a base reference to the object whose data you're manipulating, and then you have an offset within that, within that region of memory. The other way is to allocate memory uh, that is not managed by the JVM heap, um, something basically akin to malloc. And in this case, your address is a 64-bit memory address. So this sort of presents a problem, right? If I'm allocating memory on heap, how do I actually stick a pointer in my, into, my, uh, into my data structure? I can't really get a pointer to my base object because the JVM could decide to relocate that. It could change. It doesn't have a stable address. So the way that we do it, um, you know, if you think back to like basic operating systems, we build something very similar to a page table. We encode addresses basically on our on heap mode as both a page number using some upper bits of the address and an offset on that page using the lower bits. The page table is basically an array of Java objects, which we're treating as our memory pages. And when I want to decode an address, what I do is I take the page number, I index in there, and I get my base object, and then I uh, use my offset to sort of index into its memory and read and write. So now that we have these building blocks in place, let's take a look at building a hash map out of them, which we'll use as a primitive when we go and look at aggregation later. So here's the Java util hash map, which you're probably familiar with. And just to sort of revisit again some of the overheads of this. Here we have an array um, which points to hash map entry objects. Each one of those objects has a pointer to the key, a pointer to the value, and a pointer for representing the sort of overflow bucket when multiple keys hash to the same location. This has enormous object overheads because of the aforementioned Java object issues. It also has poor memory locality. Let's say I wanted to use sort of a sequential scan over my hash map to just write the results out to a file. When I do this scan, I'll be looking at, you know, relatively random memory accesses, which isn't sort of friendly to the processor cache. Finally, let's say that we want to actually do spilling to disk over the course of our algorithm. And to do this, we have to estimate how much memory we're using. And doing this for sort of arbitrary Java objects is a fairly complicated process. And we have to get away with estimates as a result. And they might not always be accurate. So in Project Tungsten, we actually build upon this sort of manual memory management technique to build what we call bytes to bytes map, which is a uh, cache efficient binary uh, hash map. The way that this works at a very high level is that we also have an array. And in our array, we store both the hash code of the object in our hash map, and we store a pointer to the key and the value. This pointer is basically an offset, encoding that address encoding I mentioned earlier, into a memory page. And in this memory page, we just have a continuous stream of keys and values in that unsafe row format that I mentioned earlier. So this whole hash map might have 10, 12 objects instead of thousands, because I'm not allocating a separate object for every row. So the benefits of this are twofold. We have lower space overheads, because we didn't pay for all those Java object overheads, and also I have excellent memory locality for a scan. There's actually an interesting optimization that we make where we can actually stride through our memory pages in memory page order, not in the order of the hash map array, and just do a nice sequential scan, nice cache friendly. Finally, um, the third piece of the tungsten puzzle is code generation. So in Spark SQL, let's consider a query that has an expression in it, like A plus A plus A. This expression evaluation, if you do it naively, is fairly expensive. If you have to like generate a sort of an expression tree and call into it to sort of evaluate your function, uh, it's very expensive due to JVM overheads. You uh, pay you know expensive costs for function calls. You create lots of objects along the way. Um, 
has a lot of inefficiencies. So if you generate custom bytecode by hand, you can basically collapse all of this down to very efficient code, much like you would write by hand, and see big performance gains. On the sort of bar chart here, you can actually see the cost of evaluating this, uh, this simple select expression over some number of rows. And you can see that code generation basically matches the performance that you would get by writing the Java code for that expression by hand. So code generation has existed in Spark SQL for many, many releases now. Uh, Project Tungsten goes further in a few respects um, in improving our code gen support. For Spark 1.5, uh, we are replacing the compiler for code gen uh, with a new compiler called Genino. And Genino takes Java source code and compiles it down to expressions very, very fast. And we're talking millisecond compilation times here. Uh, so this will massively reduce the overheads of code gen. Also in Spark 1.5, we're going to greatly expand the number of expressions that support code gen, with the goal of 100% of expressions from like HiveQL and various CDFs and stuff uh, supporting this optimized code gen path. There's a JIRA here you can go to if you want more information, and this has literally hundreds of subtasks to uh, add code gen for all expressions. So now that we've actually seen these three pieces, code generation, cache well aware data structures, and sort of manual memory management, let's take a look at how we can put them together to optimize aggregate group by queries in data frames and in Spark SQL. So as an example query, let's take this query where I'm grouping a bunch of records by department, and then for each department, I want to find uh, the maximum age and uh, the sum of all expenses. Maybe these are employee records or something. So here's how a tungsten optimizes this operation. Our aggregation operator is going to consume a stream of input rows. We're going to project these input rows according to the group, say, get their department. We're going to convert these into our optimized, unsafe, you know, memory-friendly row format and we're going to probe into that optimized hash map that I just mentioned. And this is actually, this hash map stores the results of our aggregations for each key, our running totals. Once we found the appropriate location on the hash map, we're going to do an in-place update of the data in that hash map. So we're going to increment the counts of that row without allocating any more objects. We're going to update the serialized data in place. Um, so there's no object creation on the critical path of this aggregation function. Finally, when we're done and we've consumed all of our input tuples, we're going to do, we're going to do that optimized cache-friendly scan that I mentioned earlier, just striding through the pages and writing everything out to the next downstream operator. Another interesting optimization uh, that it's in the works for Spark 1.5 is uh, sorting optimizations. Sorting optimizations are an area where you can benefit strongly from uh, cache locality optimizations. So imagine that I'm sorting a lot of records. A sort of naive way of doing this is I have a buffer that contains pointers to the records that I'm sorting. A naive layout just sorts directly on these pointers. So every time I want to do a comparison, I have to dereference two components, compare the objects. Now, in many cases, we can sort of short circuit and avoid a full comparison. Say that I'm sorting on strings, for instance. If I, I sometimes I can tell after the first two characters of my string, you know, how the you know, comparison is going to turn out. If I see record A, it's definitely before record Z. So by actually storing in our layout uh, a portion of the key prefix and a pointer to the next record, we can do most of our comparisons without actually doing these random memory accesses. So for Tungsten, we actually have a, uh, a sort operator that implements this optimization. And we use this to build an external sort that can spill to disk and merge when necessary so that you never run out of memory for joins. Uh, so this is landing in Spark 1.5. So I have some interesting initial performance results that we can share from running some of these optimizations on a customer workload using Spark SQL and data frames. So on this graph, on the x-axis, we have data set size relative. And on the y-axis, we have runtime in seconds. On um, the red line here, the one that sort of shoots up vertically, is the Spark uh, 1.4 default with code generation turned off. And you can see for this orange line, when we turn on the code gen optimizations, we see uh, you know, better scalability. When we turn on the tungsten optimizations, we see significantly better query performance. So one of the main reasons for this is that we're spending significantly less time creating objects and performing garbage collection. Here's a graph from that same benchmark uh, showing GC time. And you can basically see that when, with the tungsten off-heap mode, where we're allocating objects outside of the JVM heap, we have virtually no garbage collection. And even in our on-heap mode, uh, much, much, much less GC than the other, other modes. 
In fact, uh, the reason that the red line doesn't actually go further to the side is that it ran out of memory when trying to run uh, a larger query. So I've given you a flavor of uh, the optimizations that we can get from Project Tungsten. So now I'm going to kind of show you a roadmap to understand what's already been done and what's coming. So for Spark 1.4, which you can download now, uh, we have that binary aggregation group by operator that I showed you. We have a new shuffle manager, which does sort of a, a version of the sort, but specialized for the type of sorting that we do during our shuffle operations. We also have general optimizations to compression and serialization that will benefit all Spark jobs, not just ones using SQL or data frames. For Spark 1.5, uh, we're going to have the optimized code generation improvements, the sorting that I mentioned. Another goal is to implement many more of these binary processing operators and have end-to-end -end processing using binary data from the time that data enters the system to the time as it's shuffled and then to the end when you get an answer. We're also going to implement external aggregation operators that can spill to disk as necessary for very, very large aggregates. For Spark 1.6 and beyond, we have a whole lot of experimental roadmap ideas, uh, sort of building on the optimizations that this manual control gives us. Uh, we're considering implementing either vectorized or batched query processing, techniques that sort of go beyond tuple at a time to get bigger performance gains. So, what can benefit from Project Tungsten? Anything that uses data frames, whether in Scala, uh, Java, Python, or R, will benefit from these optimizations. Spark SQL queries as well, because they go from the same Catalyst optimizer uh, engine, will also see speed up. Now, some Spark RDD API programs will also see sort of general improvements. Any, any changes that we make to, uh, to serialization or to shuffle or to compression, we'll see benefit there. Um, although we can't do quite as much there because we don't have as much type information and semantics and schema to leverage to do these optimizations. If you want to play around of tungsten optimizations today, uh, these are the flags in your Spark Conf that you can turn on in Spark 1.4. You have to turn on code gen for any of these optimizations to take effect, and if you turn on the SQL unsafe enable true, you can get that aggregation operator that I mentioned. Um, if you want to play around with the experimental shuffle manager, which I didn't go into detail on in this talk, um, you can set spark.shuffle.manager to tungsten-sort. I just want to, um, for anybody who wants to track our prog progress, uh, Spark 7075 is the umbrella ticket for tungsten. Thanks. So I have five minutes on the clock here, so I'm happy to take a few questions. I think we have microphones over here. For we had a recommendation in terms of how much memory we we can allocate on a worker. So we generally used to allocate most of the memory that was available on the machine. But with tungsten, do we now uh, need to give memory for off heap so that that can benefit basically with that? Yeah. So this is a good question. Um, so the reason that we support both on heap and off heap modes sort of relates to this issue, right? If your memory is sort of partitioned between on-heap memory that the JVM manages and off-heap memory, it can be sometimes hard to sort of tune these settings to fit within memory limits, say imposed by like a yarn container or what have you. Um, so that's why we also support an on-heap mode, where we actually allocate very, very large objects on heap. Um, so we're still allocating objects, but much, much fewer of them. So, you know, when you're operating in this mode, which is the default tungsten mode, uh, you won't have to worry about like a separate memory fraction for tungsten. And, and since you mentioned now that the objects would be mutated, and until now we used to use immutable objects inside RDD, do we now need to make them mutable so that you can mutate them in, in memory? So, okay. So inside of Spark SQL, there are places internally in Spark SQL where we already uh, mutate objects in place, where we deal with mutable objects. Um, so this is not a significant departure from that. Okay. You can do similar optimizations in your user program if you want. You can, if you're returning the iterator, you can return a mutable object and update its fields rather than creating a new one. However, I, I want to caution you about this. Um, whether that is safe or not depends on what the downstream operator is doing, right? If the downstream operator buffers one or more records, you have literally the same object being returned, and you're going to get kind of confusing answers. If you know that you're going to consume it in a single pass and do no buffering of records, then it's safe to sort of do this mutability optimization. So it's mutability for performance. Okay, sure. Thank you. 
Are these optimizations going to be available for deployments that you spark on top of Yarn? Uh, yes, this is orthogonal to your choice of cluster manager. Including off heap? Uh, yes. So uh, two quick questions. Uh, I was wondering, so if you're doing off heap allocation, what happens if things go bad and crash in your app? And somewhat related question, what are the security implications of using the sun misc unsafe API? That's a good question. So sun mist on unsafe uh, is controllable via a security manager. And in some environments, uh, it's blocked. Because again, you can read like sort of arbitrary memory locations. You can overwrite fields of objects. You can you know, call private methods. You can throw exceptions when you shouldn't. Um, so if you have to run with a security manager turned on, we might be limited in terms of what we can do. OK. Thank you. I've seen references uh, from the blog and even from an earlier talk that were a little bit closer to the metal, like GPUs or LLVM. I wonder if you could comment on that. Yeah, so GPUs and LLVM are uh, both things that we're considering. They're a little bit further out on the roadmap, though. Um, we want to get sort of the basics of this binary processing in place before we sort of consider those optimizations. But uh, there's a lot of interesting stuff to do there, and it's something I'd like to look into. Is there any external information about that roadmap? or? Yeah, uh, follow the JIRA. I'm out of time for any more questions, but I'll be ha at the booth after if you want to chat more. Uh, Thanks. Oh.